and cast, and now BBC One keeps track of the count. night for Scotland and for the rest of the United Kingdom. The referendum is over and in the course of the night we will learn the answers to two questions. Do people want a Scottish Parliament and do they want it to have tax bearing powers? If the answer to the first question is yes, it will herald the biggest constitutional upheaval in the United Kingdom since the partition of Ireland, paving the way for a Parliament in Edinburgh by the year 2000. A yes vote would change forever the complex relationships between Scotland and England. But if the answer is no, it is hard to imagine devolution at the top of the political agenda again, perhaps for a generation. The polls closed at 10 o'clock and counting is well underway in sports centres and town halls across Scotland. The votes have been counted local authority by local authority, there are 32 in all. The outcome of the referendum is decided by a simple majority on each question. Well, with the help of the NOP BBC poll, we'll be finding out how British the Scots actually feel tonight. And by an amazing coincidence, exactly 700 years ago tonight was another defining moment in Scottish history. The 11th of September, 1297, was the day of the Battle of Stirling Bridge, an event given the Hollywood treatment recently in Braveheart. Well, we can't offer you Mel Gibson nor William Wallace tonight, but we can offer you the next best thing, Peter Snow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll be watching the votes piling up for and against the Scottish Parliament right the way across uh, Scotland. The yes votes piling up in the green box, the no votes piling up in the red box over there. Of course, what matters is the overall picture from Scotland as a whole, but the local pattern of voting will be interesting too. And we'll watch all those local counts to see whether the columns representing the winning majorities are green for yes or red for no. Tonight we'll bring you every result in Scotland. The centre of the action is the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, from where all the different council results will be coordinated. We're at counting halls across Scotland. This is Glasgow, the biggest count in the country. It covers 12% of the electorate, so that's one to watch. Some people there waiting for the boxes to come in, others already counting. We're at East Renfrewshire, which may be one of the first to declare in just over an hour. And in Aberdeen, We'll find out if the concerns the North East Express last time round in the 1979 referendum, worries about domination by the central belt, are still a concern. And we're in Orkney. Against evolution in 1979 by a majority of three to one, which way will Orcadians swing tonight? Well, back in the capital, we'll be tuning into the campaign party for the Yes campaign, Scotland Forward. We can see that they're uh, dancing already, despite the fact we haven't had a single result in. And we'll be speaking live to some of the people who've kept vigil for home rule for the past five years at the foot of Carlton Hill overlooking Arthur's seat in Edinburgh. Will their waiting end tonight? And as the votes start to clock up, we'll be joined from Westminster by an array of politicians, including John Redwood. We'll be in Cardiff, where they go through all this next Thursday when Wales holds its referendum. And we'll be in Mevergavissi in Cornwall to hear how the devolution debate plays in that part of the country. We can see there peaceful scenes in Cornwall tonight, no doubt everybody is inside, glued to their televisions. Thank and in Newcastle, you. under the shadow of the Tyne Bridge, one area of labour resistance to Scottish Home Rule in 1979, we'll hear the arguments for and against devolution for the north-east of England. There we can see the Tyne Bridge there. And now we go to Edinburgh. Well, there's the scene in the capital tonight, Edinburgh Castle lit up. There was worries earlier in the day of bad weather, but it seems to be a fine night in Edinburgh. And you know, Scottish Parliament would be built in the capital. Early in the campaign, the Scottish Secretary Donald Dewar announced that a yes vote would trigger an architectural competition for a new Parliament building rather than the cramped and ill-equipped old Royal High School. Well, a short way away is the much more modern structure of the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. And it's there tonight that the final result of the referendum will be declared. More than 700 people will pack into the main conference hall to watch the votes mount up for yes and no. Anne McKenzie is there. Anne, can you take us through what's going to happen in the next four hours? 
Well, uh, the simple answer, Christy, is a lot. Uh, as you said, all the, account, all the results are going to be counted locally, and then they will also be announced simultaneously here by the central returning officer. And he is going to be the man who will formally, historically announce whether or not Scotland has voted for its own parliament and whether or not it's chosen tax-bearing powers. And although all the seats here are empty at the moment, they will be filling up, as you said, with six or seven hundred of Scotland's great and good politicians, uh, celebrities. Everybody at the moment, though, is uh, milling about in the foyer where uh, our reporter Alan Mackay is. He's going to be keeping his ear to the ground for us and he's in uh, close contact with the people behind the scenes who are running uh, the referendum here tonight. Alan, uh, what's happening there where you are? Well, it's quite a party down here. Goodness knows what's going to happen if there's a double yes vote. They'll probably raise the roof. This is the, the grand foyer of the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, and it's surely seeing scenes that it's never seen before in the slightly sedate conferences and business events that it tends to hold. In the last few minutes, I've watched many of Scotland's senior politicians coming into this arena here, all certainly from the three parties supporting devolution with smiles on their faces. Whether those are smiles of confidence or smiles of hope, we'll just need to wait and see. Certainly in football parlance tonight, there'll be no need for penalties. We're definitely going to get a result. We'll just have to wait to see what that result is. Now, back to you up in the declaration arena. Thanks, Alan. And that's it from us for the moment, Christy. Well, now we can hear some more from Peter as he explains some of the background to the politics in Scotland. Well, Christy, Scotland's four million voters are being asked to give a reply to two questions. That's what they've been voting about today. First of all, do you want a Scottish Parliament, that was question one. Now, if they've given a green light to that, said yes to that, then that will mean that the House of Commons will have to decide whether to legislate to pass that through. It's not quite over the final hurdle, even if the Scottish people vote yes. It's still legislation of Westminster. If they say no to that, what a slap in the face that would be for the Labour government that made such an effort during the election campaign to make this a major platform issue. Second question, tax-varying powers. Do you want tax-bearing powers of the Scottish Parliament. If they say yes to that, then the Scottish Parliament will be able to vote income tax up by three pence or down by three pence in the pound. If they say no to that, well, there'll still be a Scottish Parliament with, with a little less freedom of manoeuvre. Now, of course, what is the Scottish Parliament all about? It's all about a building, for starters. As Kirsty said, there'll be a frantic competition between the architects to design something. We've got something here, a special kind of permission of the graphics artists of the BBC. Quite a pretty building, but never mind that for a moment. The key thing is this historic change is forming for Scotland. Uh, 300 years ago there was a parliament, uh, hasn't been one for something like 300 years, now there will be this thing with proportional represent with proportional, uh, proportional election will decide who sits around these seats, 129 MSPs, members of the Scottish Parliament, with the right to legislate on a wide variety of policies, not including defence and foreign affairs uh, and matters of UK budgetary issues, but 14 billion pounds of expenditure under their control, and depending of course on the answer to the second question, the opportunity to go through into the special treasury beside the parliament and perhaps open that safe there and have access to another 450 million pounds of expenditure if the answer to that second question on tax bearing powers is yes. Now what's going to happen? All we have to go on is the polls during the last four months or so. Uh, on the whole, a huge gap uh, really has been very steadily there between the yeses and the noes. Support for the yeses of something like 60%, 25% of the noes, really through the last few months. Last Sunday it was a big gap like that, uh, and it's even opened up a bit in the ICM. They're looking at ICM all the way through here over the four months, 63% to 25% uh, for the noes there. So that's question one. Clearly, if the polls are right, it should be a huge majority for the yeses there. Tax-bearing powers, a rather more interesting and close-fought battle through the last few months. Closing up a little bit, the yes is still on top here quite clearly. Closing up a little bit in the ICM last Sunday, a 7% gap there. And the very latest ICM in yesterday's Scotsman, an 8% majority for the yeses only over the nose. So clearly all to fight for there. That looks much closer than the other one. But nevertheless, if the polls are right, it should be a victory for the yeses on both counts, Kirsten. And all 32 results still to come. With me here in the studio to discuss tonight's events are four leading politicians. George Robertson, the Defence Secretary, the Conservative Spokesman, the Constitution, Michael Ancrum, Laura Steele of Aikwood, the leading Liberal Democrat, and the SNP's John Swinney, a veteran of Scottish politics but a new boy at Westminster. Well, we'll hear from all of them shortly, but first BBC Scotland's political editor, Brian Taylor, 
is with us and also uh, Robin Oakley, BBC's political editor, is also here. Um, let's look first of all at the kind of mood that you sense around the country today and the possibility that the turnout may not be as high as last time round. Okay, so the way it's looking is yes, yes, although one has to say with regard to the second question it might be a bit of a, a yes there, rather an element of doubt. Uh, already some issues being raised by the politicians in the gossip behind the scenes. Turnout. Will the turnout be high enough to give validity to the government's efforts to secure the mandate from the Scottish people that they believe they need to, to put this legislation through and put this parliament into practice? Already we've had Conservative spokespeople suggesting that if the turnout isn't high enough, if it isn't up in the 60s and towards the 70s, towards general election levels, then perhaps they might question the, the validity of that. The, the guess is a turnout round about 60, but it might, it might go below that, so we could have a question mark posed there. Not a question mark over the outcome, because the outcome only needs 50% plus one of those who vote, but, but over the, the validity. And that tax question, there is still that, that, that nagging doubt. Will the Scots go for that in sufficient numbers to, to allow that to go through? Well, let's pick up at the issue of validity with you, Robin Oakley, because validity will be something that will be looked at very closely at the south of the border, not just among opposition MPs, but also among Labour MPs as well. How would a Scottish Parliament, or the prospect of a Scottish Parliament, change the political landscape in the rest of the UK? Well, it's all part of this steady loosening up of politics, which this government seems to be about. Uh, and, and it's, I think, going to s demonstrate the, the onward march of PR as a pot political issue, because the PR element in the putting together of the Scottish Parliament, coming together with PR for European elections, uh, the kind of coalition working together that we've seen of three, the three major parties in Scotland, in the Yes, Yes campaign. It's all inducing a rather different spirit in British politics. Thank you very much for now. Well, as Anne McKenzie said, although we've heard many of tonight's results from the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, we'll also hear from some local counts around the country. We can go over now to Barhead in East Renfrewshire, an area which was the centre of some Tory scandal during the general election, and the high-profile candidate and former Scottish Office Minister Alan Stewart resigned suddenly in the middle of the campaign. Well, East Renfrewshire Council is expected to be amongst them the first to declare and Ken McDonald joins us from there. Ken. Hello from Barhead, where uh, I suppose the Americans would call it a bellwether count is taking place. This was, until May of the 1st, safe Tory territory, until, of course, the events of May the 1st redefined the term safe, at least in political terms. And what we would expect is that if the no campaign is going to make any inroads anywhere in the central belt of Scotland, then you can expect to see it happening here, and fairly early on as well, maybe as early as quarter past midnight. We're going to get a, a, a no, a strong no vote. It'll be particularly strong, you think, in East Renfrewshire? It may well be. As far as I understand it from talking to people here on the floor, they're fairly confident in the Yes, Yes campaign that they are going to get a yes on the first answer, the first question. And in the second question, well, that's a bit tighter. The one in tax varying powers in some areas appears to be too close to call. And in some areas which have traditionally supported the Conservatives in the past, it's, uh, it seems to be running perhaps even two to one against. Well, you have some of the controversial areas tonight, because no sooner will East Renfrewshire declare than you'll get on your bike and you'll go to West Lothian. And in West Lothian will be the redoubtable Tam DL. Indeed, yes. We're heading across to Bathgate, to Bathgate Academy, where the count's taking place there. It isn't expected to declare till well after two o'clock in the morning. And uh, having heard for the best part of two decades about the West Lothian question, tonight we're going to find out about the West Lothian answer. Well, we look forward to hearing that. And now we can go over to Isabel Fraser, who's at the Glasgow count. Isabel, what's going on there? What stage do you think are they at? Well, Kirsty, the main show is up and running, but let me tell you about a very interesting sideshow, as it were. The Public Shield's by-election for the City Council has just gone to Labour with a 500 majority. It's been held by Labour. It was Mohamed Sarwar's seat. He moved, of course, into Govan in Westminster in the Govan seat. So Labour held on to that one, 500 majority. The turnout, around 52% for that by-election. And the feedback we're getting at this stage, the early steer, not official, is that the overall turnout for the referendum in Glasgow might be about 50%. And we should be looking at that because indeed it's the largest electorate, 12% of the electorate in Scotland, so that's one to watch out for. Well, you see, we've got something like uh, 470,000 people could be counted through here, and we've got 500 counters, 552 boxes, for example, coming in. What we do know, whatever the actual turnout at the polling stations, we do know that the postal vote is up. 5,000 this time, 2,000 at the general election. It's also worth keeping in mind that Glasgow, the turnout for the general election, was 60%, which was comparatively low. So 50%, maybe not terribly out of sync with the turnout for the general election. Thank you very much, Isabel. Now we can go straight over to Aberdeen. Um, last time round, Aberdeen gave a thumbs down to a Scottish Assembly. Jane. 
Well, Kirsty, the early news here from the Beach Ballroom is that the turnout has been low. Unofficial estimates, and they are unofficial, put it as low as 55%. Now, that's compared with 70% at the general election. Well, far be it from me to suggest that my fellow Abedonians are apathetic, although I have to say I have sat many times and been deafened by the silence of the Todri. But even our local newspaper was, well, different, or should I say indifferent this morning. The P&J was the only Scottish paper not to lead on the referendum. It chose instead grounded helicopters and uh, Cajun cooking. Uh, we should know what Aberdeen's cooking up by about 2 o'clock, but if it has been uh, so low, the poll, it could be even earlier than that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Well, it wouldn't be a big night in Scotland without a decent party. Scotland forward the Goodwish campaign for a yes, yes vote are holding their own bash in Edinburgh, and they've started already. It'll be some time yet whether they know it'll be a celebration or a wake, but John Sokol is lucky enough to be among the partygoers. John. Kirsty, I've always wanted to say this in a broadcast, but they're reeling here, quite literally. I think they're on to the eights and reels now. Not that I'm an expert in this particular field. All these people have come here after having been out campaigning all day. And I think there's a real mood of anticipation, of expectation, and I think most of all it's going to be celebration come what may. I think the drinks have already been getting in, and these are people who really believe that now at last there is going to be a Scottish Parliament and there's nothing that's going to stand in their way, although there is the small matter of the results to be counted yet. John Silver, John Silver may be there with the malt whisky and inside and in the warm, but John Pinar is out in the cold below Edinburgh's Carlton Hill, where all the people have been on vigil since 1992. John, what's going on there tonight? Well, I think as you can see behind me, Kirsty, some of those who've been manning this vigil for the last five years in all weathers are starting to gather now for the final hours before we get the, uh, the result that they're waiting for. Now, there's a lot of argument over the years that people don't get involved in the business of politics, don't get uh, engaged in the arguments that take place on big political issues. I think people here at least would take issue with that. They've been seeing this as a symbol of the call for Scottish independence. Now, I think they'll be here waiting for the result as time goes by. For them, a very big night. Is that a premature celebration or just a lot of car alarms going off? I think people are enjoying the party already here, gathering on the streets around me, and I think making the most of a, a big night for everyone. Thank you very much indeed, John Pinar. And now we can go over to Orkney, uh, the smallest count in Orkney, and our reporter Craig Anderson. Now, Orkney went three to one against last time round, and it's still got this terrible fear, do you think, tonight of central belt domination? I'm not sure if there is such a fear, but uh, what I do get an impression of is that the people of Orkney have felt perhaps a little bit remote from the, 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 the whole debate over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and in fact, uh, a 50% turnout, which is what's been predicted, is a very low one. And I think uh, the, the, certainly the... the, the, the Scotland Forward campaign would say that was very disappointing. But when you talk about remote, think about the, the problems of getting some of the votes in here to Kirkwall from some of the smaller islands. And the, uh, the council, which is in charge of the collection, has sent out its harbour launches to, uh, to try to collect and ferry back all the votes from the wee islands back here to the, uh, the, the counting centre at the council buildings uh, in Kirkwall. And in fact, one of the, uh, uh, the, the small islands has a polling station where there are only 46 people on the electoral roll. I'm sure they'll all know what each other are voting. Uh, well, as we said earlier, the referendum is not just about Scotland's future, it's about the future of the United Kingdom. Jeremy Vines in our Westminster studio. Jeremy. Thanks, Kirsty. Not a whole lot of reeling going on down here, I'm bound to say. No car alarms either. Um, what is the rest of the country, as you say, to make of the excitement in Scotland tonight? The arguments, of course, have been whistling around Westminster for quite a time. I'm joined by three politicians, Simon Hughes on the left of your picture, John Redwood of the Shadow Cabinet, and Peter Hayne, the Welsh Office Minister, and we will discuss later on whether this is a night for celebration or despair. We'll be back to you later on. And now we can turn again to Peter Snow, who's going to talk about party support in Scotland. Just to remind you about the uh, real wipeout the Conservatives suffered in the last general election, which of course is an important part of the political background of this referendum just a few months later on. Now here was what everybody thought was a pretty bad result for the Conservatives in 1992. We've uh, put these boundaries on, the new boundaries on here, so we've adjusted for the new boundaries in 1992, so we can compare exactly what happened between then and 97. Look what happened in the last general election. That was bad enough for the Tories five years ago, but look what happened this May. The Tories literally wiped off the map. No blue on that map at all. The Labour Party on 56, the best they've ever done. The Liberal Democrats on 10, the SNP in 6, no Conservatives there at all. And look what's happening here on the map. Here's the Labour Party winning Dumfries, eastward, places they've never won. I mean, these are really very safe Conservative seats in a normal situation. It was a terrible year for the Tories. Look back uh, to the 1955 
uh, government, Anthony Eden's government, with 36 of the 71 uh, seats in Scotland, and look how things have declined for the Tories since then. As you pass over the years, through the Thatcher years, into the major years, you have 11 in 1992. Nobody thought it would get worse than that, but my goodness it did. And the interesting thing is that John Major then fought on the union of Great Britain and, uh, and Northern Ireland, the UK as a union. Uh, that fell down then, and it fell down even worse this time. And what's happened since the election? Well, there's a general election figure with the Labour Party way ahead of the others. Since then, it really hasn't got any better for anybody uh, except the Labour Party. And you can see in the last, uh, in the last final poll there, uh, only yesterday in the Scotsman, the ICM poll, Labour Party on 52%, above half the support in Scotland, way up there, 52%, their best since the even since the general election, with the Tories down here on 14%, and the others not really much further ahead than that. But the Tories are a very poor third there. Uh, in the polls. So that's the background of this election, the Tories and their worst electoral position in Scotland in history. Kirsty. Thank you. Well, Michael Anker was a sorry tale for the Conservatives and you wanted this referendum. I think it's important that we have a referendum because a referendum is to try and sort out a particular issue and the views of the people of Scotland on it at a general election, as we know. It may have been one of the issues, but there were many other issues at the general election. We suffered a big defeat in England where devolution was not an issue. This referendum therefore gives us a chance, as Tony Blair has said, to assess the settled will of the Scottish people, to see whether the Scottish people as a whole want to see this type of devolution. I think we should respect that democratic verdict that we're going to hear tonight and see whether the settled will has been expressed in the way that we think it should. You say you should respect the will of the people. If tonight it is a yes, yes vote, does that mean that from now on the Conservatives will turn themselves into a pro-Scottish Parliament party and will waive the bill through Parliament. We have great fears about what lies down the road if there is a yes, yes vote tonight. Those are very real fears. Those fears don't go away. But we've always made it clear that if it is the settled will of the Scottish people to have a Parliament, the Conservative Party would play a part in it. But I do have to say, I mean, we've heard tonight of polls of 50% in Glasgow. Only half the people of Glasgow are prepared to vote. Donald Dewar actually said, we all, need, we all need to vote. Every one of us, it must be a real test of public opinion. That's the test I'm looking at tonight. Donald Dewar's test. David Steele, do you uh, hold with that Donald Dewar test, or would you prepare to accept a turnout between 50 and 55%? Well, I agree with something that Malcolm Rifkin said very candidly last night, which is that the real decision on this was taken at the general election last May, and really the settled will of the Scottish people displayed itself then. This was a major issue in the general election. The Conservatives score, score zero, as Peter Snow has been, just been pointing out. And the referendum, in, in the view of our party, was entirely unnecessary, but it's there, and we've worked at it. <laughs> and I think it will produce a convincing result. Entirely unnecessary. George Robertson, um, a shadow Scottish secretary at the time, when they said of a referendum, was that you went through an incredible amount of grief. Do you think at the end of the day that it would actually be worth going through all that grief? Absolutely. I think uh, that uh, what we are seeing today, what we're likely to see today, is a very clear manifestation of what the will of the Scottish people is. Mike Lankrum is right, and I, I very much welcome what he said. I don't think he would have been saying that if we'd been progressing with the Scottish Parliament simply on the basis of the general election. So what we've done, what we did before the election, was to spike the Tory guns so effectively that we, they were wiped out in the general election. We knocked on the head this ludicrous and deceitful campaign about the so-called tartan tags. We went to an election where the Tories were wiped out, and now we are likely to get the verdict of the Scottish people, which should hasten the progress of the bill through Parliament and stop the unelected Lords from obstructing it in the way that they probably would have done without the referendum. John Swinney, um, this campaign has not been marked by great enthusiasm, you know, apart from uh, Sean Connery's first uh, political speech in which he invoked uh, the declaration of our broth, apart from anything else. But let me just put to you um, what Alex uh, uh, Salmon said pre-election. Tony Blair is hostile to Scotland, and his p position is profoundly ignorant of Scotland. Do you apologise for that now? Well, I think there are many uh, points made in the heat of election campaigns, pre-election uh, and sometimes post-election, uh, which all parties make. And I'm quite sure I could trade a litany of comments that maybe even George Robertson has said about the SNP in the past. Surely not. Uh, possibly, <laughs> possibly. There may be, there may be, the, there may be the odd yeah, remark that he may have made, this, and he may say them in the future. This amazing I think the most love important... affair. I want to know. Well, I want to know when this amazing love affair is going to come to a, a nasty end. Well, I think. Well, I'm not going to predict <laughs> the demise of, 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 of love affairs in politics. I think what's important is that the parties who have members of parliament in Scotland came to a position in this referendum campaign where we decided we would respect the wishes of the Scottish people and we would work to bring out those wishes and we have done that. Thank you very much for now. Now we would like to go over to the conference centre in Edinburgh and Anne. 
Thanks, Kirsty Well, with me now, Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Alistair Darling, who's been uh, campaigning for devolution, he tells me, for 20 years or so. Alistair Darling, talk there of a possible turnout as low as 50 to 55 percent, although, of course, we're not absolutely clear yet. Would that affect the mandate, do you think, of a parliament if turnout were low? No, as you say, we don't know the turnout yet, and it was bound to be lower than the general election. Uh, but if we've got a yes vote to both questions, that gives us the mandate that we sought and it will able, enable the government to deliver another one of its manifesto however promises. Low that man, however low that turnout may be. Well, I, I'm confident that we will have a clear expression of opinion uh, from people in Scotland. People here have been discussing uh, constitutional change, devolution, for many, many years. Uh, in May, there was a clear expression in Scotland that they wanted a change of government, a new Labour government. And if people have voted yes to both questions tonight, that will give us a clear mandate. It will be the settled will of the Scottish people, and the debate about whether or not Scotland wants devolution will be behind us, and we'll get on with actually delivering uh, the scheme and the Scottish Parliament itself. But are you really happy that the truncated campaign that we've had, this, this hundred hours, has really allowed the issues to be explored in full? The issues of the principle of devolution, of constitutional change, have been discussed in Scotland really for the last 50 years and intensely in the last five or six years. Uh, and I think there can't be anybody in Scotland who hasn't had the fullest opportunity to make their mind up. But what and about I suspect most, most people actually made their mind up some time ago. What about the claims of the no campaign or that it has been in some ways a campaign of intimidation against people who said no to a Scottish Parliament? That if anybody popped their heads above the parapet, they were accused of being unpatriotic? Uh, well, uh, that simply isn't true. As, uh, Sir Bruce Patello of well, the Bank of Scotland, for example? I, I made it very clear on behalf of the government uh, that everybody in Scotland was fully entitled and indeed they're welcome to make their contributions. That's what the referendum was for, to engage in debate, and there was vigorous debate uh, uh, throughout the campaign. I think what you're getting from the no campaign, which you know, at times has looked suspiciously like uh, a front for what's left of the Conservatives in Scotland, is a touch of sour grapes. People in Scotland have been discussing this issue for years. I think the settled will of Scotland will become clear tonight and if there is a yes vote, then that is putting the matter uh, to rest once and for all. There will be a clear mandate for the government to deliver on this manifesto promise and to get on and to hand power back to the people and make a decisive change for the better in the whole of the British Constitution. Okay, Alistair Darling, thank you very much indeed. Kirsty? Thank you. And we've had our first absolute turnout. And the turnout in Murray, which is a small council, it's uh, Margaret Ewing's area, SNP's Margaret Ewing, Murray is 57% turnout, which may reflect the rest of the country, we don't know yet, but it seems to be a reasonable indication. Well, next Thursday, the Welsh vote on the proposals for devolution in their country. Events in Scotland tonight have been watched very closely in Wales. Indeed, it's thought that the outcome tonight might have a major impact on the outcome next Thursday. Hugh Edwards joins us now from Cardiff. Hugh. Kirsty, this is what it's all about here in Wales, an assembly of 60 members, and the key word there is assembly. It's not a lawmaking parliament like the one being offered to you up in Scotland. It's a much weaker body, though it does have a ready-made home here in Cardiff City Hall, if, of course, it chooses to use that. Now, what's interesting about the Welsh story, if I can put it that way, is that there seems to be still a degree of uncertainty about the results when we get it a week tonight. So during tonight's programme, we're going to be asking why there is perhaps that degree of ambivalence here in Wales, and we'll also be asking what the impact will be, if any, of tonight's vote in Scotland on the results here in Wales a week tonight. What do you put that ambivalence down to? I think, Kirsty, that frankly we still have the shadows of 1979 upon us in the sense that people are still not quite sure of their identity. It's very much an historical question when you've had a country like Wales with no proper institutions of its own for hundreds of years, apart perhaps from the university, it's not surprising then that people aren't quite sure how to express their identity nationally in political terms. Now, whether the picture has changed so much in 18 years, we'll have to wait an extra week to see. But I sense, Kirsty, that actually what's happening tonight in Scotland will have quite a big effect. And the worries in Wales about a low turnout or a lack of enthusiasm, they may well be weighed upon very heavily by what you're reporting tonight. Thank you very much, Hugh. Well, the government's plans for devolution don't just stop in Scotland and Wales. There are proposals to devolve power to the regions of England as well. Tonight we'll be in two areas south of the border, in Cornwall and Newcastle, to discuss the aspirations of people there towards more regional government and indeed to seek their reaction to developments in Scotland tonight. 
First, Michael Crick joins us from Megavasi in Cornwall. Michael. Well, this picturesque fishing village, I suppose, is about as far as one can get from Scotland on the British mainland. But the question, of course, here is, if devolution's good enough for Scotland and Wales, why not for Cornwall? The people I'll be talking to accept there's not much prospect of a Cornish assembly, but what is in prospect is devolution for the whole of the southwest, covering seven different counties. The problem is that's likely to be based in somewhere like Bristol or Taunton or Exeter. And for many Cornish people, those places are almost as remote as London is. Oh, Michael, thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you later on. But now Diana Medill joins us from the Picture and Piano pub at the Quayside in Newcastle. Now, Diana, um, a hotbed of resistance among Labour MPs in 1979 to devolution. What's the atmosphere now, do you think? I think they can fight back a bit more because Labour's not shying away from the prospect of regional assemblies. And what you have here are a lot of local politicians and business strategists dreaming up ways for the regional assemblies to make them work, to make them competitive so that they're not cast in the dark shadow that devolution in Scotland would cast over them. However, if it's a no vote in Scotland, and that's a big if, if, if it's a no vote in Scotland, then all the plans for devolution here in the northeast of England could well be scuppered too. But we'll follow it tonight in the light of the vote in Scotland over the border. And now we can go to Craig Anderson, who's also in a pub. Well, I've come down to a local pub to see if I can assess the mood here in Orkney. Now, Alec, you're a farmer. Why are you so much against the Parliament in Edinburgh? Well, I think that uh, the last thing we'll really need in here is an extra layer of government and all the bureaucracy that's, that's going to entail. But how's that going to affect your business and, and, and agriculture, for example, here in Orkney? Well, if we have to start paying taxes just for the privilege of living in Scotland and working in Scotland, it's obviously going to make us less competitive. We were way south of the border then. But your own MP, Jim Wallace, is very much in favour. In fact, he even wants more powers for the local council. Yes, well, uh, I think that possibly he's starting to consider that uh, he's attempting to save his political credibility by trying to get an opt-out for Orkney because he probably came as well as I did that this Parliament in Edinburgh is not going to work. And up here at the far extremes of the country, we're not going to have any more say. It's not going to make any much more difference other than the fact that we'll have to pay for it. Now, Susie, I can see that uh, you're a yes voter because of your uh, sticker that you've got on. What can Orkney possibly hope to gain out of a parliament in Edinburgh? Well, we'll have a parliament much closer at hand. The elected MPs to the uh, Scottish Parliament will be more accessible to the local people of Orkney. And uh, the Scottish Parliament will be dealing with issues that are very important to the people of Orkney, mainly fisheries, transport, um, agriculture and tourism. But as people have said, it's going to be dominated by the central belt. Do you think that they'll care any more about what happens in Orkney, the, the, the members of the Scottish Parliament from the central belt, than, than MPs in Westminster? Well, I don't agree with that point of view. Firstly, because in the new government, in the new uh, parliament, there is going to be a fairer representation of the Highlands and Islands. We will have, I think, 12 uh, people representing us. Therefore, we will have a greater say, and there will be members from the Highlands and Islands in almost every committee in the, in the new government, in the new uh, parliament. Well, thank you both very much indeed for uh, joining us this evening. The declaration from Orkney will be one of the first in Scotland. That's uh, somewhere about half past one. We'll join you from there a bit later on. Craig Anderson, thank you very much indeed. Now we can go over uh, to Peter, who's had his crampons on. Uh, well, you might put it that way, yes. I want to give you a little demonstration now how low the Tory fortunes in Scotland have sunk, but yet, interestingly enough, the very parliament that they oppose so strongly, the Scottish parliament, may be their quickest and easiest way to begin to climb back. Just imagine uh, the challenge to the Tories in Scotland as a mountain. A mountain, a rather famous mountain, Ben Nevis. A mountain all Scots will know very well. And imagine that the supreme electoral triumph is the summit of Ben Nevis up here. And look where the Tories are. Look how far from the summit they are. Dangling away down here, only just above the floor of the glen. The fact is that at the last general election, they failed even to collect 20% of the vote. They didn't even a fifth of, the, a fifth of the vote. They had just 18% of the share of the vote. It won them no seats at Westminster at all. They'd have to go up through a fifth of the vote to something like 22% of the vote, according to our experts, if they're going to achieve just one Westminster seat, assuming uniform swing from all the other parties. And to get back even to where John Major was at that dreadful election for the Tories in 1992, their second worst in recent memory, 
they would need 29% of the vote to win 11 Westminster seats. Now look how far all that is right down there from that supreme electoral triumph at the summit of Ben Nevis up the top there. They'd need something like something like 47% of the share of the Scottish vote to win the majority of the Westminster seats in Scotland. That, of course, would be something for the Scottish Tory party to celebrate. It really would. Indeed, that sort of share of the vote in Scotland would also bring them a majority of the seats in the Edinburgh Parliament. So, much the same. Any party has to get an awful lot of share of the vote in Scotland to win a majority in the Edinburgh Parliament. But the intriguing thing is that that Parliament, of course, is elected by proportional representation. And when you start bringing the Tories down to the more realistic levels at which they're scoring in Scotland at the moment, the sort of 29% share that would bring them 11 seats at Westminster, that proportional representation would bring them 40 seats in the Edinburgh Parliament. Go down to the sort of level that would bring them just one seat at Westminster, and the Tories would still be winning, on the same share of the vote, something like 27 seats in the Edinburgh Parliament. And even if you go right down to where they were at the last general election, less than a fifth of the vote in Scotland, at 18%, that would win them 22 seats or so in the Edinburgh Parliament, something like uh, a fifth or a sixth of the seats in the Edinburgh wow. Parliament. So the extraordinary irony of it all is that the Tories, the Parliament the Tories oppose so strongly might indeed begin to offer them some recovery of political support in Scotland. Thank you very much. George Robertson, how does it feel to possibly be the architect of a Conservative revival in Scotland, which could then lead to a Conservative revival at Westminster? Well. I've been saying all along that one of the features of the scheme that we designed in Scotland was that it was going to be fairer and more consensual. And I will all the time try to tell the Tories that perhaps they should look on this with a little bit more generosity as we had done in the first place. We're trying to create something new and different, not a replica, not a sawn-off version of Westminster, but a new parliament that will be much more consensual, indeed the way it was formed. You, the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party are in bitter competition in Scotland, but we came together along with a whole series of other elements, including the churches, the unions and local government, in order to make sure that a very different parliament was created. And that is precisely what it is that I think the people of Scotland have recognised in the model we've got. So if it gives a little helping hand up to the Conservatives, you know, so be it. That's part of the new tradition that will come in Scottish <coughs> politics. But they've got to fight for it, and I'm, I'm certain that if they fight in the way that they did during this campaign, they're not going to do as well yeah, as Peter Snow said. I think, I think there must be some uncertainty over the prospects of the Conservatives <laughs> in the light of that campaign, because there has been a display of the learning of no lessons from the general no, no, election. Wait a minute, John, sorry, a lot of very prominent <laughs> Conservative faces have not been evident during this campaign, Quite. which would lead people to presuppose <clears throat> that they're actually already well, on the list for a possible Scottish Parliament. Well, they may well be, but there have also been an awful lot of Conservative faces to the fore of the Think Toys campaign over the last number of months. And they've displayed many of the antics, many of the approaches which have been so rejected by the, the people of Scotland in the general election. So there has to be a lot of signals coming from the Conservatives that they have learnt lessons from the results of tonight's but referendum. My, uh, Michael Ankham, on the in the spirit of entente cordiale between uh, George Robertson and, and the Conservatives, what light do you put on Baroness Thatcher's intervention when she put in her tuppence worth and said that she thought a Scottish Parliament would lead to a reawakening of a kind of dangerous, she didn't use the word dangerous, but I'm paraphrasing, sort of English nationalism. Do you really take that to be the case? Well, I've always said one of the dangers of a Scottish Parliament is it becomes the focus for discontent between Scotland and England, and that can work both ways, and that's a danger which I think we're all very much aware. But if I can resist the siren voice of uh, Peter Snow, our objection to PR, although it might help us uh, in these particular circumstances, is that it does not produce open government, it does not produce good government. But Where in 1979, it, it Alec Douglas Hume came out just before, two weeks before uh, the campaign and said, no, you must vote no because we'll produce a parliament with tax raising powers and it will be elected under proportional representation. Yeah. I don't think he quite said that, I think, if you look up the quotations. <laughs> I think he said that there would be something better, was what he said. I think I have it here. I, I, well, we will check that out. Right I, I, I've, I've, I, I've had a, 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 some experience of dealing with governments who, which are coalitions elected by PR. The trouble is they are governments by deal. They are governments which are inherently unstable. I don't so you don't believe in consensual politics? You don't believe in consensual politics? It's not a question of consensual politics. Politics by deal, by behind closed doors, is not necessarily good well, government. But it won't, it won't, it won't so, 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 it so David Steele, basically, uh, PR, be which you're, of course, so yes. enthralled to, is just something that uh, is inherently behind, unstable, as far as no, I'm concerned. There's nothing behind closed doors, and nor will the Conservative Party be getting a free ride in a cable car. They're going to have to 
fight for their seats in the Scottish Parliament. But I'm surprised that Michael Ancrum is looking this gift horse in the mouth. I mean, the fact is that they're going to get fair representation in the Scottish Parliament, which they don't get at the moment in Westminster. And I, I think that that's something that they ought to welcome. Well, let's uh, just look to hold it there. And let's just take a summary of where we are at the moment, because we actually do it just have one turnout. We have two turnouts. First official turnout, 58% reported in Murray. Second turnout, Clackmannan, 66%. Now, that turnout is higher than it was in 1979, so that's the actual uh, firm data we have at the moment. And now we can go over to Jane Frankie at the Beach Ballroom in Aberdeen. Jane. Hello, Kirsty. Well, as you've already said, the central belt bias card was played pretty heavily up here. The question is, has it affected the vote? Now, the early indications are, and they're very early, of course, that it may not have affected the vote. The yes, yes camp are, in fact, looking a little more confident than the others. But I've been joined by two, if I may call you that, gentlemen, Devo skeptics. Um, Derek Marnock, who's chief executive of Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce, and farmer David Jack, who's been on the Scottish NFU Council for, well, the best part of the decade. Uh, Mr. Marnock, first of all, I mean, I know you're not dressed uh, like this on, on our account, but because you've just come from a dinner from offshore Europe. I'm the, here to celebrate the result, whatever it may be. The vast oil exhibition. Now, you have sounded words of caution about all this, haven't you? Tell me Well, the feedback why. we've had from our members in the business community is that roughly three quarters of them are not enthused with the idea and uh, even more are, are even less enthused about the thought of uh, increased taxation. But none of them have actually come out and said this is going to be, well, not to put a fine point in it, this is the end of life as we know it, this is going to be oh, a disaster no, it's, happening. It's, it's not going to be the end of life as we know it, but we've seen what happened to the like of Bruce Patullo when he uh, uh, almost dared to say that maybe this isn't such a good idea, that he was almost uh, hailed as public enemy number one in Scotland. And the rest of the business community are essentially pragmatic. They said, well, if that's the sort of treatment we're going to get, we're going to have to deal with these people in the future. Uh, let's keep our heads down. Uh, David Jack, you're a farmer. You have a farm. Uh, apathy seems to be the order of the day here. Has that been the same in the country as well? That would be the case. Why very is much that, so. do you think? I think uh, there's no sort of urgency. It's not like an election where people have to be voting for a principle. Uh, and the feeling is the decision's already been made. We have a new parliament, it was in the, in the manifesto, it's a consultative re referendum, there is not much interest. What are your own fears about it, not just as a farmer, but um, a, a, as a member of a rural community? Because a lot has been made of that, hasn't it? The fact that the central belt is so urban-based. Well, my great fear is, and really talking as a farmer, is that agricultural policy in Scotland could be determined by uh, a, a, a central belt socialist mentality. But why is that any worse than any other kind of mentality hundreds of miles away in Westminster? Well, I think the checks and balances of a Westminster Parliament is, is a protection, uh, certainly to our industry. Uh, don't forget that agriculture is Scotland's biggest industry. We're part of the food business, and the food business is very much a national organization. Uh, we're too small in Scotland uh, to be parochial uh, in, uh, about this. Uh. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Back to you, Kirsty. Well, Aberdeen, as we say, was one of the areas who had uh, great difficulty last time around. Uh, David, uh, Liberal Democrats are in control of a lot of areas which were very skeptical last time, obviously. Orkney, the borders and so forth. There are still residual concerns, aren't there, about the central belt domination, despite proportional representation. Even, you know, Jim Wallace, the Scottish Liberal Democrat leader, went so far as to say, Orkney and Shetland Islands, don't worry, because even if you have a Scottish parliament, there'll be further devolution for you, recognising that there is a problem. That, that was actually an amendment proposed by Joe Grimmond at the time of the last bill, and, and Jim Wallace has, has revived it. But the interesting thing last time round was that almost the further away you got from the central belt, the greater was the anti-vote in 1979. In the borders, it was sort of 60%, 40% against. In Orkney and Shetland, I think it was much greater than that. And I think that the, the proportional representation scheme has changed that. And I'll be looking at that 60-40 no vote in the borders last time against what is undoubtedly going to be a yes vote this time. And you'll see a big turn, turn round because the PR has made mm. all the difference. The outlying areas are going to be properly represented. There is not the fear of mm. domination by the central belt. But, Brian Taylor, we've only had two actual official turnouts so far. But what you'll be looking for, presumably, is turnouts in all these outlying areas. I mean, people might just stay at home. And also some indication of differential turnout. Is it the case that those who are perhaps inclined to vote no 
are staying at home and those who were inclined to vote yes are, are putting that into practice. The, 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 the gossip, if you like, the information coming from, from behind the scenes is that that may be the case, that the no vote, to use a good Scottish phrase, are simply scunnered by it. They saw it coming, they saw they were losing and they stayed at home. David Steele, indications as well perhaps that uh, David Steele's party are not quite the enthusiasts for, for home rule that they might like to interpret. Some of the opinion polls throughout the campaign suggesting that, that, that it was the Labour Party and above all perhaps the Scottish Nationalists who were the enthusiasts at this stage for devolution. Well, we'll, it, we'll, ex we'll, explore, that. we'll, we'll well. explore that later, certainly. But now we can go over to Anne McKenzie at the Edinburgh Centre. Anne. Yes, Kirsty. Well, uh, I'm joined here by two bitter enemies, or at least they should be. Lord Fraser of Carmyle, who's director of Think Twice, and Yvonne Strachan of Scotland Forward, the yes and no campaigns, of course. Yvonne Strachan, uh, what would you say is, is the word on the street with your workers? Is it looking to you as if you won the day? Yes, it is. I think... Um, Obviously, you never know till the, all the votes are in and we've seen the count, but the feeling on the street is that uh, we've won was definitely the first question and we've won the second. And I think, well, I think we're, we're hoping that it's a comfortable position. That's the feeling on the street. You never know till the votes are in and counted, but the feeling is good. And uh, we've got a sense of excitement that we're heading for something new and exciting after, after the 4.30 this morning. Well, Lord Fraser, are you, it's early days yet, of course, but uh, are your indications anything different from Yvonne's, or are you anywhere close to even thinking of conceding even the first question? Well, I must say for Scotland's day of destiny, as it's been repeatedly called this week, if it uh, appears to be the case that uh, less than 60% of Scots actually bothered uh, to go out, it uh, seems to me it may be not quite the grand occasion that many thought it would be. It looks certainly to us at the moment that on the first question there is going to be a majority. On the second question, I think it is uh, certainly closer, but I suppose what we're really most interested to see here now is that uh, I've always been troubled during this campaign and indeed before it that Scotland has for too long been treated as some sort of homogenous unit, that all Scots have exactly the same reactions wherever they may be around Scotland. And I think the early indications I've got, and they may, I may be proved to be entirely wrong, but the indications are there's going to be really quite significant variations around the country on the first question and more particularly on the second. That would be important, wouldn't it, Yvonne Strachan, if it is seen that, okay, the central belt wants this parliament and may want tax raising powers or varying powers, but the rural areas like the highlands and the borders might be more doubtful. Well, I think we have to wait and see, uh, as I say, till the count, till the votes are in. Um, I think the indications are that um, from all the campaigning that went on before, that the polarisation that there was in 79 in the northeast and in the borders hasn't materialised this time, that there's been a greater unity around the yes, yes question, partly because there is unity in the camp, the yes, yes camp with all the political parties and in the civic community. And I think that that will be reflected in the vote. But what about I this think the turnout if it is only 60%? This is meant to be the settled will of the Scottish people. They don't seem very passionate well, about I think, it. Well, you see, I, I think it depends on how you define passion. I think we had this issue has been campaigned on for a long time. The uh, issues have been debated with great passion and fervour. There are many thousands of people taken to the streets in the course of this campaign. Um, if you take the campaign over the eight years that we've been running through the convention, um, the turnout in the general election, which was astounding, I, I mean, in terms of the vote that was, was materialised for those parties that were reflecting constitutional change, I think the settled will of the Scottish people is what we're seeing today. And uh, certainly the feeling on the street is no less passionate just because people haven't been uh, waving their flags or, um, if you like, uh, demonstrating it in uh, ways that other, you know, that, that might be more characterised as a sort of passion and flamboyance. But can I take issue with something or, or raise something with uh, Lord Fraser's point about uh, aren't we concerned about the, uh, there being differences throughout Scotland and the way in which we look at things. That's one of the very reasons why we're arguing for a Scottish Parliament and why people will be voting yes Very briefly, yes, Lord Fraser, very briefly please. I just think this has been a rather unedifying campaign in many respects and I'm afraid that is one feature of it that we haven't really been able to explore and what really troubles me is at the end of the day, in spite of everything, actually, uh, those of us who live north of the Tay, beyond or be above or below the West Central Belt, we're going to be dominated. Right. Lord Fraser, Yvonne Strachan, I'm sorry we have to leave it there for the moment. Kirsty. Well, no results in, but you've obviously heard Lord Fraser there concede in the first question. Well, now we can go from inside the conference centre to out in the cold under Carlton Hill, where John Pienaar is with some of the people that have been on vigil since 1992, and indeed, uh, 1,980 days after it began, the vigil is due to end on the 12th, no matter which way the votes go. But John Pienaar is there with some of the people now. John.
well, more and more people now gathering here at the vigil to uh, watch the results come in, looking for the best result possible. People honking their car horns as they go by, well wishes adding their support. There was one or two people here just a short while ago uh, from Wales uh, giving their best wishes, looking for a good result. We could tell they were from Wales. They were draped from head to foot in an enormous Welsh flag. Now, one or two people here who've been pretty much consistently supporting this vigil have joined us now. Mike Ferrigan was here in the very early days. Mike, you must feel you're coming to the end of a, a very long road. Well, it is indeed a very long road for uh, ordinary Scottish people who are basically from a non-party political background. I mean, they've been spent five years here, day and night, um, and they've been completely disenfranchised and for so long, the majority of them uh, continually wanted the Scottish Parliament. It looks like our dreams are being now realised, but I think it's more than that. I think um, what we have to do from here is continue the consensus that the main party political leaders have shown and not have a kind of Scottish Parliament where we're stabbing each other and fighting each other. But we're all hearing, the time. we're hearing, Mike, aren't we, about the fairly low figures for the turnout coming in from different parts of mm. Scotland. You must be disappointed that a number of people don't share anything like your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in, in party politics in general. I mean, this is a non party political organisation. I think people are, are disenfranchised and they'll continue to be disenfranchised until power gets devolved even more. And I mean by that to the local communities of Scotland, England, Wales, and wherever. Well, let us talk now just briefly to John Orr. Now, you've been joining the vigil not for very long, and in your case, a rather a case of life imitating art. Just tell us, how did you get involved in the vigil? Yeah, uh, I first uh, came to the vigil two years ago. I was inspired by the great part of countless others. And, so part uh, of the Mel Gibson tendency? Yes, right? yes. I mean, it was like initially an impact uh, to describe the period of our history that uh, most Scots didn't even get brought out of school. So what you do is you, you learn more, you want to read the books, you talk to people, and you people, people find out more about it. And that's how I got involved with the vigil. Uh, the vigil. Thank you very much. Kirsty, back to you. Thank you very much. Now we can go over to John Sobel, who's inside at the Scotland Forward uh, campaign party, which is now full of people awaiting the first result. John. Yes, Kirsty. The Scotsman, perhaps a little unkindly, said this morning that if you wanted to escape from Peter Snow's graphics, this was the only place to come. And I'm joined now by Cathy Wood, who was entertaining us earlier when you came to us earlier, and there were the reels going on, and Andrew Hume, who have been, who's been out campaigning today. Yes. Uh, exultant mood, how would you describe it here? It's very upbeat, isn't it? Oh, very much so. I think everybody's very confident there's going to be a good result tonight, and I think it's going to be a new dawn for Scotland. But also a sense that you've been waiting a little while for this. Well, I think ever since 79, I think everybody's been, well, everybody was very miserable after 79, understandably. And it's been a long time, actually, to sort of see this night again. Uh, Cathy, it hasn't felt like a general election campaign, has it? No, there's, there has been an element of just a bit of hesitancy yeah. about this. Um, I think under the circumstances, we'd, you know, this is a kind of final decision. A general election, we get another chance in five years' time. But this is a great night for Scotland. This is something that's been waited for for a long time. What do you mean by hesitancy? Well, I think when people know that in five years' time they can change the, you know, the nature of the government, um, then perhaps there's a bit more cavalier voting going on. People that are maybe a bit more reserved or a bit more thoughtful about their choice, um, you know, on this particular issue. I think, I think what the problem is is the fact that uh, governments come and go in general elections. But this is the first time for 300 years that Scotland's had a parliament. And I think that's historical, that the day of destiny, in fact, is quite intimidating for an awful lot of people in Scotland, you know. Some of the political parties have almost tried to play down how radical it is that the changes are not going to be that great. Do you think that has been sort of deliberate? Because the changes are going to be radical, aren't they? Well, I think it depends on what you mean by radical. I think, um, I think it's going to be radical, most importantly, for the Scottish psyche. The fact that we're going to have some self-confidence and we're actually dealing with our own affairs after so long, I think that's going to be radical. In terms of um, other aspects, I don't think it's going to be radical. I think we're a common-sense people, and I don't think we're going to go crazy, you know? So... Um, I don't think Who knows? So. Who knows? <laughs> I think the good thing for, for us is that, you know, 50% of this parliament will be women. You, what, um, you know, there's going to be a 50% uh, block of women actually represented in this parliament. That's quite significant, isn't it? I think that's significant and highly important. It's something which women and Scottish women have been waiting for for a long time. Um, so from that point of view, I'm, I'm very pleased. This is uh, looking positive. <laughs> 
I think we better hand back to Kirsty because the stand-up comic has just started again. Who knows what sort of jokes we'll be telling? Thank you, John, Kirstie. and I, I can reassure everybody that I know that there are people in that party actually watching Peter Snow's graphics avidly, and so we'll give them some more. And now it's Peter with the shape of the Parliament. Oh dear, I hope they can understand this one. This is really quite complicated. The central feature of this Parliament is the fact that it's going to be elected by proportional representation. And what this will mean, in principle, is that the share you have of the vote is reflected in the share you get of the seats. That's the intention. It doesn't quite work out that way exactly, but that's the intention. And the way you do it is you have two votes. People would have two votes for this Scottish Parliament. First of all, they'd elect quite simply and directly, first past the post seats, 73 of them all together, splitting up Orkney and Shetland into two seats. So if this was the last general election, for example, uh, on the basis of the last general election, that's how they elected the Scottish Parliament, you'd have exactly the same number of seats, Labour on 56, the Lib Dems on 11, up one, the SNP six and the Conservative no seats at all. So those would be the 73 first past the post directly elected seats. Now, of course, that would give Labour a huge advantage in the Parliament, and it doesn't reflect the share of the vote that the parties have. So you then add on 56 proportional seats to top up the vote. And you do that by splitting Scotland up into eight big areas, actually the European parliamentary constituencies, and within those areas you make sure that the parties have the share of the seats that they have share of the vote. And this is where you find the SNP, for example, and the Tories topping up their seats, the 22 in each case, if people voted exactly as they did at the last general election. Hope you can understand that. Anyway, let's go into the Parliament and have a look through the doors and see what happens inside. On that basis, what would the 129 members look like in terms of political colour? Well, here we are inside the Parliament, proportional representation in the election. Here's the sort of thing that would happen. First of all, the biggest party, of course, Labour. There are the red figures filling up. Nearly half the chamber, they're going round in the big circle here, yes, no, not quite, one space there, 63. Then next to them, the Liberal Democrats, with, if you add those proportional seats, the first past the post seat, 16. The Scottish National Party, yellow ones there, totting up to a total of 28. And the Tories, represented in the Scottish Parliament, as they aren't, of course, at Westminster at the moment, the Scottish seats, 22 Tories. All of those, not directly elected, but due to their share of the vote, something like a fifth of the vote in the last general election. Let's just swing it round and put the winning post in and see whether Labour are quite through that winning post. There it is, the halfway mark. There it goes, the halfway mark in the 129-member parliament. 63 Labour members, one Liberal Democrat sitting there, not quite through the winning post. So the illustration here is it's very difficult, it will be very difficult, for any party, whether it be Labour, the SNP or whatever, to win a majority in this parliament because it's proportional representation. We'll pick up on that in a moment. I'd just like to tell you that uh, the turnout in South Lanarkshire is 63.1%. Right, George Robertson, on those figures, you'd be one short of a majority in a parliament. Now, you've pledged uh, only to use your tax paying powers after the term of the first Labour government at Westminster has run out. But you might not be in a position to exert that authority. And it might indeed be that a coalition of the other groups including the Conservatives in a Parliament, would actually vote for tax paying powers before the end of the Westminster government, and then Tony Blair would have broken his promise. Well, Tony Blair is not going to break his promise. Labour is not going to break his promise. So if we have, Well, that. let me just say, Labour is delivering tonight. It took a Labour government to get this referendum. If there's a Scottish Parliament follows on this, it is because Labour, a Labour government nationally, has delivered on that. But can I complicate Peter Snow's wonderful graphics here? Because there's one factor he hasn't taken into account, and that is... On that the is a virtual ballot. parliament. On the, <laughs> second, the second, on, the second, on the second ballot, people, people will be voting for a political party. So the end of tactical voting will come about. People who, for, 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 for instance, in an area who want to vote against the Tories by voting for the Nationalists or for Labour or whatever, will vote for the party of their preference. So uh, it is not a simple... Uh, John Swinney is shaking his head. Well, he well, may say that, but, but I'm, all I'm saying is it will be up to the parties to fight. Mainly. If the Tories <laughs> fight the way they fought this campaign, then I don't think they're going to be in, in, the, in the Parliament on that representation. But Swinney, and Labour is going to fight a campaign for a devolved Scottish Parliament, for a devolved Scottish policy. It's going to fight in there, and I believe that we can win a majority, and we should win a majority. John Swinney. Well, you know, we can all trade different permutations of what will happen when we at last have a, a system of proposal representation that will allow votes to count for what they stand for. If you look at opinion polls before the election, they showed that voters are uh, voting in a Scottish parliamentary election uh, free of the, the fear of the Conservatives winning in the United Kingdom. Uh, the polls were 39% for Labour, 38% for the SNP. So it, PR changes Scottish politics and frees Scotland from the, 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 the hangover of voting for the Conservatives but, or a Conservative but, government. But just, just let's pick up on that, Jim Wallace. I mean, you were the only party 
in the general election that campaign for us a hypothecated tax, one penny on education. Now, it's not inconceivable that a year into the Parliament you could actually think of a grand project and Donald you did say it would be a project that you would want to raise some extra taxation for. Would you be hidebound by Tony Blair saying that it wouldn't happen in the first term of a Labour government? Tony Blair's policy doesn't bind the Liberal Democrats. Uh, I mean, we will fight our own, we will put our own programme before the Scottish, uh, Scottish people at a, at a Scottish parliamentary election. And it's up, this is the whole point we've been arguing through the referendum. At the end of the day, it's up to the people of Scotland to decide who they want to elect on the basis of the programme program before them. Can I also pick up the point in proportional representation? I think we're, we're in a completely new ballgame. Parties are going to have to learn how to fight a different style of election. Take the city of Glasgow, for example, which at the moment elects Labour members for all first-past-the-post seats. I mean, you, an argument could be put on the second ballot. There's not much point in voting Labour because they're already going to have more than their proportional share in first-past-the-post. So there'll be an encouragement for people to perhaps vote for other parties. Uh, on the second ballot, and I think we're into completely uncharted territory, and the parties are going to have to start learning some new tricks and well, new ways of actually fighting that kind of election. Let's look at how uh, tax played during the campaign. You didn't have all your own way in tax, Michael Ancombe, did you? Well, we had a lot of difficulty in pointing out to people that it wasn't just income tax we were talking about, but there were other taxes available within the white paper, such as variations in terms of local government taxation, where the Parliament could raise money if it so chose. And maybe but the Scottish people got that. I mean, maybe, I mean, I think the whole, the interesting thing about the other three people is that they've actually managed to coalesce on one point because it keeps them from falling out, which is trust the Scottish people. The message from the No campaign would be, listen, you're not listening properly. And I, it was a not rather patronising negative attitude no, rather I'm, than saying, sure look, we can offer you the status quo and the status quo is fantastic. No, I mean, we've learned tonight, listening to this conversation just now, that consensual politics hasn't really gone much past no, the, that's the, not, the that's end of the no, that's, that's not but fair at all. I think it is actually fair to make a point, and it's quite interesting, this, that at this election, I don't make any complaint about it, at this referendum, the media has decided not to be observers and commentators, but to be participants largely, and that has made our oh, job. That better. was the accusation oh, made by well, 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 At this point, let's, at this point let's go for some actual, uh, some polling information. Um, now, BBC NOP uh, conducted a poll, not an exit poll, but a poll on voting intentions and various other matters. Now, Peter's now some information on that. Peter.